welcome everybody. Uh, today is actually quite an auspicious day. It's the birthday of Mahatma Gandhi, and of far less significance, it's the birthday of my youngest son. <laughs> so today I'm very happy to be able to introduce to you uh, Professor Damodaran Namputiri, uh, whose work I had been made aware of when I was working on uh, my book of about a, 10 years ago uh, on affirmative action in India and the United States. I first met Professor Namputiri three years ago when I had the uh, pleasure of visiting the center that he helped to found a little over a decade ago, and uh, which is he has been serving as executive director since uh, 2008. The center is known as CREST, uh, the Center for Research and Education for Social Transformation, uh, located in Kojikode, formerly Calicut, in the southwestern state of Kerala. In addition directing, to directing CREST, Professor Namputiri is Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences of the U University of Kanur in Kanur, Kerala. And uh, to say a few more words about his background and his activities, uh, he has a master's degree in sociology from the University of Jaipur. He is a member of the advisory committee for the Southern Regional Center of the Indian Council for Social Science Research in Hyderabad. And he's a member of the expert committee of the Center for the Study of Culture and Society in Bangalore. His recent publications include articles entitled Transformation in Family and Sexuality, Globalization in the 21st Century, uh, and Caste and Social Change in Colonial Kerala, Confronting Social Exclusion. Now he here at U of M, uh, we've had a lot of experience with issues raised by affirmative action over the last uh, decade and a half. Uh, and of course, affirmative action goes back to the 1960s in this country. India is the country uh, with the longest experience of affirmative action going back to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, no doubt each country has much to learn from the other uh, in this area and that's surely one of the reasons that uh, the office of the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Professor Lester Montz, uh, agreed to co-sponsor today's lecture for which uh, we at the Center for South Asian Studies are very grateful. One thing we've learned from both countries' experience with affirmative action is that it's critically important for the beneficiaries who typically come from disadvantaged educational backgrounds to have access to programs that will help prepare them for the demands of a challenging higher educational environment, as well as the demands of the contemporary job market. Now this is exactly what uh, Professor Namputiri uh, and his colleagues at Crest uh, have been doing in an exemplary manner. Uh, so I'm delighted to introduce him to you uh, to speak on the topic of addressing underrepresentation in the time of globalization, a Kerala experience in affirmative action. So please welcome uh, Professor Namputiri to our center. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, uh, and a very fine evening to all of you. Uh, <coughs> I should thank uh, Dr. Farina Mir and, of course, Dr. Tom Weisskopf for this invitation to the University of Michigan. I think uh, when I say that uh, I am totally at home here, it is sort of a homecoming uh, to Ann Arbor, it will sound a very impudent to most of you when you realize that I am coming to the United States for the first time with my wife. Uh, <coughs> you can, uh, there is a Jewish word which I think you, all of you know, Hupsa, which says that, you know, the most um, atrocious statement, you know. <laughs> Why I say so is because my brother studied here um, in the late 1960s and early 70s with Professor Ronald Friedman and o Professor Otis Dudley Duncan in the department of, if I remember correctly, sociology and population studies. Oh, uh, he used to say so much about an apple. So I knew where he lived and all that. He used to send me photographs. 
and he married again my sister in law mala k pain she hails from cardiff of oh, i forget uh, the name of uh, um cadillac yeah <laughs> some of you must be remembering isn't it <laughs> yeah uh -huh. is south northwest of uh, michigan i have heard about all that again a lot and my uh, sister in law uh, also was a student way here way, when they met and all that and got married and now they are in san diego i am on my way tomorrow to san diego so this is uh, a great fortune for me a great privilege for me to be with all of you and share a few thoughts i didn't prepare a big uh, scholarly talk with a lot of powerpoint you know i it will be a kind of a rambling presentation you should bear with me <coughs> of course i have to mention about tom a little bit because it was he who told me about you know how affirmative action can be done with a lot of sensitivity his book has really broken fresh ground in affirmative action research in india and of course us and one thing i remember very specifically is how he mentions uh, about the elite sections both in us and india and compares them in a very interesting way i didn't understand you know the implications at that time when i read it when the book was published that time how the affirmative action programs whatever is done in us is much more sensitive especially when you look at the admission processes and the support programs which are right here in the university of michigan were initiated you know such sensitivity i realized when i started working with the center which was at that time part of the indian institute of management code code we i remember i still remember every day professor h kaldro the founding director of indian institute of management code code who thought of this idea of what should he do to kerala when the iim was established in <coughs> uh, 1998 and uh, because dr ar vasavi that again brings me back to michigan vasavi was of course uh, in he did her doctoral work in the michigan state university i believe and she has been there as faculty in uh, adjunct faculty at i am code code when i also used to help her a little bit with the they had a course uh, for the mba students in social transformations in india and uh, uh, that is the time when we thought of this center center of excellence as uh, it was supported by the government of kerala the ministry for social uh, uh, sorry uh, social welfare for scheduled castes and tribes now thereafter um, we uh, had developed uh, a five months we call it a uh, post graduate certificate course for professional development we found gradually that the professional graduates or uh, post graduates from dalit and adivasi communities had a big set of problems to confront and that was a time when in the end of 19 90s and the beginning of the <coughs> uh the 21st millennium you know there were very fundamental changes happening in kerala too in terms of uh, the new uh global order was coming into place and i think that is the time when <coughs> um professor kaldro thought of this course uh, started taking 40 students uh, um, after a written test initially we got rid of the written test because you know entrance tests are difficult all the dalit and adivasi students most of them who come from um, remote rural areas they were scared of any such tests so we 
conducted interviews, very uh, long interviews, and selected 40 students. And now the 20th batch is in session, and uh, I'm happy to say that 30% uh, of the, so we have nearly trained 750, uh, most of them engineers, and 30% of them work in high-end jobs all over the Indian metros and some of them abroad. There is a girl uh, now in Silicon Valley, California, with the Infosys. All this was possible thanks to Professor Karl Rove, Professor Vasavi, and my colleagues at Crest V gradually were able to bring in some social transformation deep in the hearts and minds of these students. Because we are, you know, it is a kind of one-to-one -one teaching, you know, it's, it's not actually any kind of, a, um, I would say, didactic teaching or learning there. Mostly it was through games, through a lot of uh, action programs, you know, um, um, interactive sessions. We had, uh, start with, we had five modules, personality development, of course, to bring them, you know, most of them were, uh, while they were students sitting in the back benches, as you know, that is the true about Dalits and Adivasis anywhere in India, whether schools or colleges, they will be shy and diffident and sit back. And now, to break that hesitation and bring them into the open and take charge of themselves was a tall order for all of us. But uh, I should say that, you know, we had wonderful faculty colleagues who had, many had international exposure as well as uh, the highest training in India and experience in <coughs> such specific uh, training programs. Some of them were corporate trainers too. What we did again was to make them, you know, the most important problem was to make them speak English. You have, you are already a B.Tech graduate, but you can't speak one sentence correctly in English. How can you then go for jobs in the corporate sector? So I, when I look back today after t in 2002 to 2013. Anyway, 10 years in full, we find uh, um, we are very, very pleased with the work all of us have been able to do. Why I say this is because, Audrey, can you help me with uh, uh, those pictures before I briefly also mention? Yeah, uh, by the way, we were also doing uh, programs not only in Kerala, but we have been uh, also helping SEST students in IIT Delhi. Uh, uh, we actually conducted a 10-day self-enrichment workshop for the students who joined the BTEC program there. So 150 of them came from morning to evening. We had sessions. Basically, we had three sessions there, one on communication, English communication skills, including academic writing, including public speaking, etc. The second was on self-enrichment proper in terms of uh, making them open up and uh, take charge of themselves. There are several uh, games through which we go. And of course, the third part was theater again. We had faculty from National School of Drama helping us. So at the end of the evening of third, Tenth day, they have to make a presentation uh, of theater. We found that theater from the very beginning, micro theater, mm -hmm. as well as uh, the real um, theater, I, <coughs> we, we do it every time in uh, Crest back in Kori Code. The last 19 batches had staged after a one week workshop a theater piece in, Eng in English. So, um, <coughs> yeah. yeah, that's again, um, 
the way, you know, it just shows that, you know, the, the students are gelling the, from the day of number one, we, you know, we call it uh, ice-breaking sessions, you know. They become friends, they come to know each other, the uh, groups are formed and, uh, yeah. Um, and also, this is uh, the theater presentation at IIT again. Um, I will continue with this brief presentation. This is again at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. We start with the uh, uh, sessions and then again uh, aims, of course, we have uh, the <coughs> self-enrichment modules and finally the theater presentations. So here again we have also programs at Karnataka, National Institute of Technology at Suratkal. Uh, we do more programs in NIT Suratkal, including a, a kind of a finishing school for the sixth semester students, and also the orientation workshop for the first years. Yeah. Uh, then back in uh, Kori Code, we have the IM students also helping our students. Uh, this is a kind of a peer group interaction between IAM students as well as our students and uh, again the same and again uh, this is their uh, <coughs> IT uh, uh, session going on and uh, yeah another very important uh, point I just to mention is uh, the presence of international interns in our center. Right now we have uh, two um, postgraduate students from Germany uh, working for three months and uh, living in the women's hostel and helping them speak English and also lo get a lot of uh, soft skills. This of course uh, we have the valediction. When I reach there on November 10th we have the valediction of the 20th batch. So we have, uh, uh, we also sing the song, we have a dream. You know that. Um, <coughs> Martin Luther King. So you see the, uh, I won't show more uh, uh, photographs. I can, yeah, thank you. Let me come to uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, basically, uh, uh, what are we doing? You know, we have been thinking about it. Uh, I wrote a chapter in a book called Beyond Inclusion, The Practice of Equal Access in India's Indian Higher Education, edited by Satish Deshpande. Tom mentioned about that, published by Rutledge a few months ago. I had uh, tried to analytically look at the kind of experience we had in dealing with them, how <coughs> we drew from various uh, resources in terms of theoretical as well. Uh, including, of course, managerial studies, we had behavioral sciences, we had uh, social sciences and humanities, how to make them learn English. You know, we <coughs> really uh, dismiss the usual Indian school system where you start with a, a five-year or ten-year-old boy or girl, you start them with grammar so that they become scared about uh, thinking or speaking or <coughs> writing English. So we told them, you are already a graduate, you don't have to worry about making mistakes. You speak, but you have to speak. So we encourage them to gradually overcome. So by the third or fourth month, we correct a little bit their grammar problems. But otherwise, uh, we make them speak in English spontaneously. And of course, the presence of uh, a very uh, accommodative group of faculty and interns helped a lot. So many of them, of course, also presented uh, theater uh, in English only. And we had lots of theater uh, experts coming from Sri Lanka or <coughs> Delhi or other places. And uh, that helped a lot. But then, uh, I would like uh, to raise uh, one or two more issues. Uh, 
we uh, I told you how uh, we were encouraging them to go out of Kerala into corporate sector where you have to have cutting edge, edge cost competitive skills you know major problems were of course uh, uh, in making them develop a personality where they can face anyway very competitive interviews group discussions and uh, we have uh, uh, other modules like general awareness uh, we have a, a, a very interesting person now uh, who had a PhD in political science from Cambridge University who is uh, in the IIM who gives them regular sessions on uh, global issues and globalization. Now, <coughs> the basic issue when I uh, look at it uh, is the question of uh, reservation in India. Unlike the affirmative action in the US, of course it is a huge kind of effort because you give reservation quotas or preferential discrimination and give seats in educational institutions as well as in the government sector, job opportunities are given to them. But <coughs> the point is, uh, when we looked at it, we found that they join IITs and uh, all the institutes of medical science and all that they get admissions but what happens is that many students don't pass the exams in the stipulated four years or five years right in Kerala we looked at the situation we found that you know the other day in uh, November <coughs> 2012 the Center for Development Studies made a uh, very interesting uh, study on how many students pa get uh, passed out from engineering colleges in Kerala. Only 17.8 percent of SCST students actually pass the exams in four years, while the uh, largest number is represented from the Christian community, 72 uh, percent pass out in four years, followed by 60 percent of upper caste Hindus and 50 percent of Muslims and 40 percent of other backward communities. So this <coughs> is again very, very <coughs> interesting and very painful in the sense that you get admission but you are not able to go through it. So this. Uh, is corroborated by the study which we also conducted in various colleges, engineering colleges in Kerala. We found <coughs> that something urgent has to be done when we became autonomous in 2008. We developed a one month program for the enriched students, BTEC students of Kerala, where we found that, you know, most of these students fail in the first year, you know, because the two semesters are. Uh, <coughs> after the first year, first two semesters, you know, the exams are conducted together and the most difficult papers like engineering graphics, mechanics, and engineering mathematics are taught at that time and that is uh, uh, the point when most of the Dalit and Adivasi students fail. So we uh, also involved very committed engineering uh, professors who taught them before the classes begin, you know, they, we kept them for one month and gave them all the soft skills. Apart from that, we gave them rigorous training in engineering, uh, mathematics, graphics and uh, mechanics. And we found that it really worked. And in many cases, almost 50 percent of the portions were covered within one month because the faculty were so dedicated and the students were so enthusiastic so that the classes began at 5.30 in the morning with uh, all kind of uh, games and all that. Then it continued up to 11 o'clock in the night. So you, you won't believe it. I mean, they also staged a theater at the end of one month. You know, you see that that age after the 12th standard, you find the uh, students are most outcoming and you can 
transform them. So what kind of theory we are we following? This is again I asked uh, my colleagues and our myself, Dr. Vasavi, we all had lots of um, brainstorming about these things and we found that we, we borrowed from Polo Freire and then um, the social transformative learning of uh, Mezero is a very important name in the uh, US uh, uh, Academy, I believe. It's a very interesting contribution. Uh, you can just Google and find out social transformative learning <coughs> where the critical thinking skills are given to students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds and made them self-aware. Find out your own <coughs> strengths and uh, weaknesses and overcome the weaknesses and again uh, move forward. So <coughs> I have to mention a little bit about Kerala because Kerala's colonial and post-colonial history has a different trajectory altogether. For instance, <coughs> you know, uh, while in most other states, the Brahminical castes or the Savarnas dominated in the modernization uh, project, in Kerala, the Renaissance in thinking, in ideation came from the subaltern caste. You have the backward caste guru, Sri Narayana guru, you know, who transformed even the mindsets of the upper caste in a big way. His uh, slogan was, one, one caste, one religion, one God for humanity. So that again, was a breathtaking jump from a very caste-ridden society, very hierarchical, where you had customs like unapproachability and distance pollution, even unseeability. There is a caste in central Kerala called Nayadis, who is not supposed to even come to the visible range of the upper caste persons. The unseeability was practiced in Kerala. That is why when Vivekananda came to Kerala, he called Keralites people living in madhouses. So that's very true. And that is from this kind of a situation where uh, we moved on to some kind of a dramatic change, very radical kind of change through the social reform movements in which Christians, we have 20 to 25 percent Christians, an equal number of Muslims, and the Hindus forming the rest of the 55 percent. And again, among these 55 percent of Hindus, 25 percent of uh, backward castes of Iravas are a very critical factor. The Narayana Guru hailed from the Irava background. So you could see that there was no Brahminical dimension to the whole transformation. So it is from this base that you have the communist movement coming, on, not so much earlier, the nationalist movement coming. So the freedom struggle and also the class movements were built on the foundations of this kind of a uh, thought revolution initiated by Sri Narayana Guru and also in which the Dalit leaders like Ayagali also participated. So much so that when the independence came in 1947, um, you know, there is a study conducted by Dr. Casey Alexander in uh, uh, 1970s, I believe. Actually, the left government comes to power for the first time in 1956. Later on, the land reforms were implemented in Kerala for the first time in India, very seriously because owned and I mean land uh, cultivated by the peasants, the law ownership was given to the peasants in the 1969 bill, which was implemented in 1970. Uh, there is a very interesting study of the attitudes of uh, peasants and workers, which was conducted by K.C. Alexander. It came in a volume edited by M.S.A. Rao and uh, um, Francine Frankel of JNU. 
in this he pointed out i just give an example of uh, you know he compares karnataka and kerala in karnataka uh, the peasant or the laborer was asked a question it was from the mandya district where a large number of uh, uh, agricultural workers and peasants were there one question was asked will you sit near a dalit while eating food in a taking food in a restaurant the same question was asked to peasants and agricultural workers of kerala located in alappuzha district which is of course the rice bowl you find that 98% of uh, the keralites said i have no problem i am ready to sit very close to a dalit and eat my lunch in the, in the restaurant while almost 75 or 80% of the workers and peasants in mandya district refuse to accept that this is a, just to point out there are several other attitude statements in this study i just want to only highlight this so it shows that there is this distinctive change so in the post independence kerala you could see a sea of uh, transformations taking place in terms of inter introduction of a uh, uh, public distribution system you know amartya sen has written extensively on this even in his latest book uh, uh, in which was published a few months ago uh, the uncertain glory about india um, along with uh, long drays you know so that's a very interesting book uh, uh, throws a lot of light on what is happening even on inequality in india <coughs> so <coughs> what what uh, um the uh, typical departures kerala's educational departures in the sense of you started schooling providing schools school admission to everyone from the 1950s onwards i remember dr kusum nayar when she came to kerala in the 1950s after the left government took over she wrote this book blossoms of the dust she mentions that if you travel through kerala you remember that it is a kind of a ribbon state maybe 500 miles long and uh, like chile 50 60 kilo miles uh, broad and you know you could see processions of school children starting from 8:30 to 10 if you have an aerial camera you can see the processions going back after 3:30 to 4:30 the students going back to schools this was possible because of the specificity of indian i mean kerala's uh, land settlement pattern we have continuous habitation there so that you can have houses one after the other it is very difficult to separate one village from the other because you have continuous habitation whether you tra travel by bus or by train you can see that and um, this again help the schooling it is a god given opportunity in the sense that you can plan schools every kilometer every one every mile and everyone is taken care of so, so you can easily walk half half an hour you walk to the school and come back and this is this is not possible in tamil nadu or many other states because you have nucleated settlements nucleated villages and there is a lot of space in between so but what i wanted to say is that all this is uh, fine but what happened to higher education in kerala amartya sen himself says in an earlier statement that kerala's experience in higher education is extremely regrettable i i don't know whether I, that's the word he uses but the meaning is the same in the sense that you messed it up so the engineering education for instance in the 1990s you know i have been looking at it you find large number of uh you know opening up globalization and then uh, large number of private players coming but then there was no <coughs> benchmark or rules for the game so they started the um engineering colleges but there was no proper faculty or proper teaching and uh, as a result of which they thought that they could make a lot of money because there were large number of aspirants but what ultimately happened is that the dalit students most of them were admitted to these kinds of 
very bad quote unquote engineering schools and this is a one issue which i would like to just mention but coming back to again um, the question of uh, what we do at crest and uh, what is it uh, what does it mean to transform those students who come from a disadvantaged backgrounds how can we help him or her to compete with the his or her peers in the college or in the university so we found that this is a uh, uh, possible as we also found that you know why did iit delhi invite crest is a small institute in kerala or all india institute of medical sciences there were suicides of dalit and adivasi students there the supreme court intervened so they had to invite somebody and they found that we did some work in this field so we find that you know the uh, the interesting thing is that <coughs> what we were attempting in through our programs was to provide these students a kind of a opening a space a level playing ground so that through various short programs they are able to discover their themselves and their i would just read out one uh, couple of paragraphs from what dr vasavi wrote in a recent article on social transformative learning and its relevance to india you know in aims I, we had a very interesting experience there were only 70 students in the first year mbps all the students were put into our disposal and then we also included a social transformative learning content of a different kind so that we made the elite students from the mainstream communities to support those students who come from the disadvantaged backgrounds so we concentrated more on the peer level friendships so that you know the basic problem with dalit and adivasi students in uh, higher education is that they never get any mentoring support from their family you know this is again one area we have uh, looked at closely in kerala also we find how um, um, when we conducted focus group discussions with our students who have already completed btech they pointed out that their peers from the advantaged communities had the following uh, plus points they had better schooling at various levels they had superior social and communication skills they have high aspiration levels they have relatively privileged economic backgrounds they have mentoring support from parents who are professionals or well educated they have better social and cultural capital which enables them to lead more engaged on campus lives now um, <coughs> interestingly we study we ask these students when um, engineers who join our flagship program of the five months uh, uh, professional development what is your experience in the engineering colleges what kind of uh, alienation what kind of exclusion you experience they said that uh, because they lack uh that kind of social and symbolic capital what they do is uh, they enter into all kinds of activities which you can call sidelined unimportant you know in terms of for instance you know co curricular activities you have to organize something the dalit and adivasi students will be doing lot of manual work to organize a function while the the mainstream students will uh, be very clever and <laughs> they will never do waste that kind of time on these things even in political uh, kind of uh, activities this is again the same case um you see that um, when you look at social capital you know you have the whole theory developed by economists uh, um and uh, political scientists and sociologists 
This is one concept I believe that is very, very important for operationalizing in the Indian context. I believe that, you know, you know, we, you know by and large we know that uh, you have human capital uh, when you, for instance, uh, uh <coughs> think about one's uh, qualities or characteristics that are valued in the marketplace. While social capital is uh, something, is a value, an individual receives from his community identity. It may be uh, some kind of uh, critical information through networks and mentoring and reciprocal favors. So you see, uh, <coughs> I can go on making a distinction between um, the writings of uh, uh, economists or political scientists and there are subtle differences. Bordeaux, for instance, very clearly makes the statement that educational inequalities are in reality economic inequalities in a uh, subtle form. So uh, that kind of uh, uh, <coughs> understanding is very important in analyzing um, where should I stop, you know, I can answer more questions in between. Um, what I just wanted to wind up and say is that the, uh, <coughs> the social skill model which we developed was very, you know, to the extent possible, very carefully uh, conceived in which we respected our students and uh, um, as Vasavi points out, when she <coughs> interviewed some of our alumni, she mentions how uh, one of our alumni, uh, <coughs> though I am a scheduled tribe, I had never gone deep into the details of the community. But the self-actualization module at Crest gave us an opportunity to know more about our own communities. We had to interview elderly people from our own community, which enabled me to know more. There were people who really, uh, who really came out successful through hardships, but there were also people who still are bound to an attitude of not changing for the better. <laughs> I will read out one or two more paragraphs. Another alumnus pointed out that realization of caste-based differences and of the impact of the caste system on their lives was significant for him. My attitude to my community and society had a major impact after Crest. I started thinking about unprivileged people in my society and community. We actually give a break in the five months program. We send them away for one week to study their own community elders so that they spend time and collect a lot of data, qualitative data, how they grew up, what kind of uh, untouchability which was practiced at that time, what kind of humiliations, what kind of pains and suffering they went through. This was collected over the years and we are planning almost a book on this. We are in the midst of working on it. It provides, you know, because we get students from all the 14 districts of Kerala, so we find a, a lot of interesting uh, details on that. I will me just mention that our vision um, is to move towards new horizons of creating a just, equitable and caring society through empowerment of the marginalized and underprivileged sections based on the principles of humanism, equality and social justice. Our mission to facilitate the marginalized and the underprivileged to gain confidence, build competence and achieve excellence in all spheres of human endeavor for their social, cultural and economic development through education, training, research and consulting. Our specific objectives included helping 
SEST candidates to compete in the open market for admissions and jobs in institutions and organizations of repute as well as assisting them to compete as research and development scholars. It also provides training to improve the competence of members of scheduled communities while working in the organized sector. We also give training management development programs for SCST officials, middle level executives working in the government of Kerala. So, uh, we have been, uh, I will stop here I, I rather than uh, continue in a monotonous way. I request. So, uh, uh, it's time for questions. If anyone has any uh, they would like to pose. Uh, uh, why don't I see. Well, I think the microphone would be helpful. If, uh, do we have a yeah. microphone to circulate? Audrey? Yeah. Thank you for sharing your uh, experience and that of your, your colleagues at Crest. I just want to ask you a question uh, somewhat f from a more radical and I would hope at home in Kerala perspective where capitalism uh, was not the only alternative on the political and social horizon. And in the name of your institution, you talk about social transformation. But much of what you seem to be saying has to do with your investment in individual transformation. That is, in making uh, both students and other professionals with tremendously disadvantaged backgrounds fit into the world as it is now. A world where English dominates, although in a country like India or in a state like Kerala, I don't know why it needs to, uh, uh, training them to fit into management as it exists today, training them to fit into a market. And you say, you, you know, I'm, I don't want to disvalue these things, but from the point of view of so much of what has happened in Kerala, where you can speak of uh, humanism and equality and social justice, I mean, how can you do both that and prepare people to work effectively in a capitalist market society? Where's the social transformation? It's all yeah. individual transformation, I think. Yeah, um, can I answer him right Please now? Do, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for this question, you know. Um, I just quote Dr. Narendra Jadav who hails from, I think you might be knowing, yeah. uh, at least heard about him. He came and gave the Kair Narayanan Memorial Lecture, uh, the first lecture. What he said was, like Dr. Ambedkar, you have, that he told Dalits and Adivasis and other marginalized communities to educate, agitate. You know, see, um, the, they should get the best education. That is what he said, you know. He has written his own um, autobiography through the biography of his father, you know. He mentions how his father took him. He was a poor porter in Mumbai. And he could, he, he, you know, he, wa he was able to go to the principal of a college and, or a school and ask him, uh, enroll his son into that school. See, uh, the major problem for Dalits, you know, I know that a small institute like Crest cannot change that kind of, uh, you know. Uh, the only things that we wanted to do was, you know, why these elite institutes, starting from IITs or NITs or All India Institute of Medical Sciences, that is why I uh, respect what Tom observed about the difference between US and uh, India in the sense that, you know, they don't care about what happens to these hapless boys and girls who are hesitant, you know, the, the, they, the, they come there to these big institutes and they are on the one hand very happy about it, excited about it. They were given warm sendos from the villages from they join IIT or that. But what happens is they end up uh, becoming um, I, I either, either opt out of these programs like in, the, in between and all that. This is also happening in Kerala. What I am saying is that we had a kind of a different trajectory in terms of uh, um, uh, I myself has written extensively about this kind of change, but there is a kind of a subtle casteism which has come back. The uh, 
you know most of our you know the thing is that you have to fight it out at what level you know the, there are two political groups in kerala one of course is the led by the indian national congress and again by a communist group left groups but who are just mouthing their slogans not very sincere about it i believe i am i i believed in them that they would really uh, deliver but they have stopped doing that because also because of other reasons there is a mid widespread middle classization in kerala because of the gulf opportunities many keralaites have gone abroad and the remittance economy is working and even here there are very few dalits and adivasis who go to gulf countries or other parts of the world and uh, whatever they send back they are very very insignificant so this is the kind of scenario where we thought of this small experiment okay mm. Yes, I think Ram, you had a question. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I really enjoyed learning about the program. I'm from Tamil Nadu. I, I do this sort of program in Anna University where I work with women engineers. Um, so I find uh, in your discussion you didn't talk about the specific challenges faced by Dalit women. So the intersection of being a Dalit and a woman has a particular way affect their lives. So in fact, when we find the program, we actually change the whole thing because they gave us feedback what it means. So the whole gender nature of the intervention has to be taken care of. Did you talk about how you develop a program looking at specific issues, how it affects women's life? Because women, when they're working, um, when they go to work, they also, first time going to work, there's enormous challenges in terms of being a woman, take care of a home and working, which is a very big issue for Dalit women. So they talked about it in the, in the in our training program. So I wonder how the experience in Kerala has, has been here. The interest rate is much higher than Tamil Nadu for a long time. Yeah, one thing I would straight away say that the women's literacy rate has nothing to do with the women's empowerment per se. You know, Tamil Nadu and Kerala. You know, we have almost similar uh, kind of uh, right. literacy levels right now. Right. But I believe that you know, uh, whatever humiliations women experience in uh, any part of India, you know, the same happens in Kerala too. To a big extent in the sense that you know the ho whole issue is much more complex i believe uh, but um, before i answer that i just want to say that at crest we give uh, a lot of uh, pro uh, workshops on uh, sensitizing on gender issues i am also happy to say that many of them later on when they got jobs in uh, multinational companies in bangalore or mumbai they marry one another and spend very homely beautiful lives in the sense that they are very very uh, because we have we told them that you have to respect each other particularly women um, men students are tuned to a very different outlook in kerala i have to speak about the repressive sexuality we inherited from the victorian morality and all that you know you know i remember when i a small boy i have to sit uh, you know when i have punished the the most severe punishment for a an 8 year old boy like me in the school was that i was asked to sit among the girls you are not supposed to do that you know the boys sit on the one side and the girls sit on the other side and you have exclusive boys and girls schools all over you know things are slightly changing now but then this is a very long old story and uh, and there are quite a lot of very active women <laughs> campaigners and activists in kerala um so rapes take place but then uh, they really don't let it go like that but uh, it is a long term struggle i believe in india <coughs> thank you i just want to echo what's been said thank you for sharing um your thoughts and and also telling us about your institute um i think i have most probably two comments one is which maybe echoes a little bit what um what lee said which i was thinking also which is that while i i respect entirely the project and appreciate where it was coming from uh you've chosen to target a very particular strata of the dalit community in a sense students who have already 
actually achieve many, many markers of success and a very slim strata, obviously, right, of, of the Dalit community. So not undermining in any way the work that you're doing, I wonder if you wouldn't mind speaking to us a little bit about what broader um, mechanisms might uh, also be at play to, to more broadly change the social realities for Dalit students. And it's not unrelated to really my second question, which is maybe to ask you a little bit about um, affirmative action as a broader program about the reservation system in India and your, um, your senses of the way in which the reservation system is actually working and the ways that it is fundamentally not working. I mean, as a, as a scholar of South Asia, um, caste discrimination continues to be an everyday aspect of, you know, everyone's lives in India from what I can tell. Uh, so so the, the, the reservation policy is fundamentally has not worked in that sense. But of course, there are small strides. So I was wondering if you could just talk to us a little bit about your own thoughts on yeah. the governmental policies and, and also how one might, the kinds of changes one might want to see, even in governmental policies around um, affirmative action. Yeah, that's a very, very important question or questions. Yeah, um, <coughs> when you talked about the uh, broadening of uh, our work or the relevance of that for in Kerala, yeah, uh, what we do is a kind of a minuscule um, uh, program affecting rather a small number. But <coughs> I believe that, you know, when I look closely, we don't get students uh, from the elite Dalit backgrounds or Adivasi backgrounds. So most of the sons and daughters of uh, IAS Dalit officers or um, doctors and engineers, they don't apply for this program. Even though we give them uh, stipends and all that, it's a residential program, they don't probably need that. So there is a recent survey in Kerala pointing out that 60% of Dalit families live in colonies, highly segregated. This was initially, with the land reform, it was considered as a very important, uh, that giving land to uh, the most oppressed communities. But actually what happened was that they were given the most peripheral colony, land, you know, which is not very useful to, as, as you know, it happens everywhere in India. So they were, they were again uh, oppressed twice because of these colonies being formed and then um, they had very little interaction with the rest of the communities. And here again was, uh, I mentioned about the very low levels of social capital and cultural capital and symbolic capital. And many of our students come from these backgrounds. I tell you that it was a very tough uh, we had very tough time because at least uh, 20 to 30 percent of the students had problems uh, coming from fractured families, disorganized lot of alcoholism of their parent, father particularly. And, and this is the kind of milieu in which the students join our center. Of course, we get four, 500 applications, mm -hmm. but we are now uh, building our canvas by two th 19, 2014 or early 15, we will be able to shift to our campus, then we will be taking more students. But we are also planning a lot of uh, uh, outreach programs, and maybe we will have uh, again in Cochin and Thiruvanthapuram two more uh, regional centers. So we will be also giving uh, help, especially in English communication skills, etc., to college going students, or these being uh, are being planned, you know. But I believe that more importantly, you know. Until now, even in elite institutes, you know, they are good teachers, you know, IIT. We had very good uh, people, uh, friends there, you know, they tell that they didn't think that there is a problem like this, you know. They never, they never understood that why SCSC students don't pass the exams. Even if they pass, they get into the worst jobs in some government. From IIT, they go to some very mediocre kind of government jobs. Not that government jobs are bad or anything, but then, 
while their uh, peers go into better this doesn't happen uh, so this is again the whole question of uh, reservation again in the sense that you see um, it is uh, india's uh, um, reservation uh, program is the largest uh, in human history i believe you know so many seats are kept vacant for these students uh, these boys and girls from these backgrounds but uh, what i see is that per se the reservation or the quota system is not bad or good it 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 is it can be made much better provided the elite institutes included all the educational institutions recognize uh, that there is uh, there, uh, there there is a very important uh, essential commitment constitutional commitment to help them keep up with their peers they should be given the same skill sets learning skills social skills from the very beginning so if you do that and you know, that's why in iit we have been doing it for the last 4 years they um, the other day i got a uh, mail from them saying that on the average the students we trained 150 of them each in every year they performed 1.5 to 2 credits better than those who didn't participate so this is very important is that you know we cannot go to iit all the iits or all the um, all india medical institutes in india it's not humanly possible but we have been requesting the mhrd also through i am director i am uh, code code director is also involved in it dr sashi tarur is uh, uh, coming to give hopefully to deliver the kr narayanan memorial lecture uh in november or december uh, so we are he is in the mhrd now so we want them to do something own it up and say do something for the dalit and adivasi students also i would say i'm very happy to say that the new muslims in kerala are doing somewhat better because in when we went to all india institute of medical science delhi there are uh, 23 obc seats out of which 21 are boys and girls from muslim community coming from kerala i was very proud of that in the sense that you know they uh, they did it initially the aims administration was scared they found that they were doing some manipulation then they looked at the uh, scripts of their entrance test they found that they are really good and they are doing very well and this is again shows that the muslims uh, in uh, kerala really could go up because of the uh, gulf experience again you know they knew you know they went there as unskilled uh, unskilled laborers in uh, various gulf countries and though though they sent some money back home you know they knew the importance of education so that is why they are this is happening I mean, in, a, in a way the the response or the question i would have is um i was struck by the the um the gulf economy on my visit to to kerala two years ago and the signs of it literally and figuratively everywhere but at what stage are they investing then in education right i mean students have to have access to good education and 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 you know so so in this example is it that these muslims are setting up private institutions that they are then funding and producing a better education than the state system or you know i mean in a way the question is um because we 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 struggle with some of the same issues i mean michigan has been committed to affirmative action and a ruling um a, a law i mean what was the prop proposition number 2 prop 2 a couple two. of years ago has made it impossible actually for us to have an affirmative action program on the grounds of race um so now we take issues like class into account or issues like if a student's um this for graduate education I'm thinking specifically if you're coming from a family with parents who have not had access to higher education uh, we recognize this in the yeah. ways that you're saying right you don't get the family support so we recognize this and we try to put programs in place but we're already you know the question is the students are then coming to us they very often don't have the same preparation and the same skill set to succeed 
And the question is, where where should we be broadly, you know, trying to focus our energies in addition to the work you're doing? Yeah. You're right. I mean, uh, uh, I think <coughs> there should be some uh, method or uh, format in which these boys and girls should be given this extra from the institutions concerned. It is their responsibility, I think. I think Tom has written extensively on this. And I think uh, uh, in India, this is a far cry in the sense that it is very difficult, you know, you know, because you see, you know, <coughs> even in uh, IT, uh, there is a study by Vasavi and uh, Kerala Upadhyaya in the uh, about the IT workforce in Bangalore city. A few years ago, she found that they found uh, that there is hardly any Dalit or Adivasi engineer in the software field in working in Bangalore, either in the governmental or the uh, multinational sectors, corporate sectors. Most of them are from the elite sections, Brahmins from all over India or uh, Kayasas and from Kerala, mostly Syrian Christians, Hindu, upper caste and a uh, section of Muslims. So regarding the Muslims uh, in Kerala and the Gulf economy, I mean they are also investing in education, private institutes are coming up. But there are two kinds of institutes, you know, one of course is to make a fast buck, you know, make a lot of money out of this and they only look at that way and there of course we find uh, it is counterproductive. The privatization has brought in a lot of problems, you know, they don't even get good students there, not only not enough students. As a result of which, you know, the an SCST students join uh, an engineering college, the government provides them money. So the um, self-financing sector as it is called or student financed sector, they go to the government and get many SCST students enrolled in these uh, low quality engineering institutions. So this is what is happening really now, which, which are again some of them run by the Muslim community, but there are very good institutes run by the Muslim community and the Christian community. So it's, uh, two kinds of situations here. Yeah. Maybe time for another question or two. Uh, someone, yeah, Sylvia. Hi. Um, I actually knew your brother. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I worked as a research assistant at Population Studies Center run by Ron Friedman as well. Ooh. So I, I did know him. So it, it's very nice to see you and, and hear you speak. You resemble him. <laughs> 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 but, um, um, you know, I, I have a concern uh, with respect to affirmative action issues in the United States on which I have you know, spilt some blood, sweat, and tears. And that is that, you know, we have some of the same dynamics. I mean, we don't have a caste society, but the level of segregation in this society is so deep. And the school systems have been so segregated, and most of the segregated school systems have been poor schools, for example, the schools in Detroit and so on. Then the University of Michigan becomes very eager because we're committed to diversity and excellence and affirmative action and so on. We become very eager to accept students, you know, but we don't prepare them very well. You know, I mean, you're talking in, in this program that you're running with Crest of a five-month program, and I think that what we do at Michigan is a six-week program in the summer called Bridge, you know. And so, you, so if you look at our admissions figures, even despite Prop 2 and all of the, those things, um, our admissions are not bad, but the graduation rates are very poor. So I think that our problem actually resembles the problem that you're talking about yeah. a great deal. And I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you go about developing, and, and, I, and I think you have put your, you know, the finger in, in the right spot saying that a lot of what happens with those disadvantaged backgrounds is that, that students arrive without the social and cultural and symbolic forms of capital and so on. But how do you develop those? You know, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, uh, of course, uh, some of my colleagues would have answered your question much more interestingly. Um, you know, we have uh, several uh, new modules developed, like uh, one of them which we developed recently is uh, self-esteem uh, um, module, where we make them speak about their past experiences of humiliation and 
how they couldn't uh, make it uh, as a brilliant student. You know, you know, I, I would like to uh, remember right in this at this moment the very interesting book Outliers written by Malcolm Gladwell. He mentions about the two parenting traditions. The first group is the uh, middle or upper middle class parents who give a lot of uh, um, mentoring to their children in the sense that they make them work hard, do so many things at the same time, you know, expose them to all kinds of uh, tensions and experiences so that they will be also monitoring them. While the other communities, maybe in US this might be very, very true, they give them rather free in the sense that they there is a uh, um, kind of a natural growth of these where of course it is good in certain sense in the sense that they develop a kind of a, um, a mass a critical or creative imagination on their own some amount of independence but when it comes to really meeting for instance doing a course in the University of Michigan that really needs a lot of cutting edge skills that is where this kind of uh, parenting becomes very critical, I believe. Uh, he mentions about all kinds of people, Bill Gates included, how he spent in, during his adolescence 10,000 hours on computer. Maybe that was the time when the computer was coming up in a big way. But that 10,000 hours in a specific time frame is very, very critical for a Bill Gates to come up. That, that's very, very important, you know, that in any, any field, you know. That is the, the difference between people in the outliers and who are in the middle or in the midst of uh, the situation. This is a very, very complex problem. Each culture or each nationality, each uh, community has to sort it out in different forms. And I believe that uh, our model is not the perfect one or anything. I don't submit that way. The only thing is that we, we were able to deliver a little bit because 30% of our students are in high-end jobs many of them in corporate sectors and they got promotions some of them got leadership awards in their uh, corporate uh, offices and doing very well traveling all over and 30 uh, percent um, are also going for higher studies you know as far as you know you should see some of our students when they join an engineering uh, graduate what is your ambition in life you say to become a conductor in the Kerala State Transport Corporation, you know, you know, he wants to get a government job, you know, that is the kind of background from which he comes. So this is again, we don't then brainwash them or anything. We tell them that you have these kinds of strengths with you, and it is actually all our programs are dialogical in the sense that we use um, digital camera, photograph the way you come to for an interview. Lots of mock interviews and mock group discussions are done. We show it to them along with their classmates and each of them will comment on how you make the mistakes, how you don't look straight into the eyes of the interviewer and all that. You know, small things, but these are critical in the sense that these students don't have that. They were never exposed to this kind of thing. This is where you have to give some kind of premium to this reality which you find in all societies, I believe, all over the world in different ways. So I think this is a question which we have to put our heads together. I also wanted to discuss with all of you of a, an international workshop on this. Uh, we could associate with some of you, maybe. I mean, I think we have to, this is a very urgent issue, you know. You just, quota is not enough. Giving a seat in a in institute is not enough. How, how to go about it? Do something in the schools again, you know. I think it is the schools have failed, Dalis and Adivasis, more in Kerala uh, because uh, they run into uh, poor, poorer schools in Kerala, government schools particularly. So this is a very, very complex set of issues and uh, let us put our head, I don't have any last word on these things. Thank you. Uh, one more question from there, yeah. I feel like I have to ask this question, especially since you just mentioned the schools. First of all, thank you for all the work that you do 
equipping um, SCSD students and uh, the institutions to better set up these students for success. Um, and I just wanted to follow up on a theme that you just raised, which is by the time they get to that stage, um, chances are they've already fallen so far behind and the odds are stacked against them. So I was wondering if you could speak a little more to some of the investments that are being made on the side of primary and elementary education. The, the fact is, as you pointed out or alluded to briefly, is that you know these government schools are chronically underfunded, over-resourced, I mean under-resourced and overcrowded. Um, my, my parents themselves went to you know government-run Malayalam medium schools in Kerala. So oh, yeah. um, it, it's, it's hard being able to equip students with the kinds of skills that you talk about when um, you're spread so thin. And are there um, sort of multi-pronged approaches to attacking the problem from much earlier? rather than to kind of undo some of the damage that's been done by the time they reach the stage that yeah, the yeah. program is trying that's to. That's a very important question. Farin, I mean, in Punjab itself, there is a, in, in the book I mentioned, Beyond Inclusion, there is a chapter by uh, a group of professors in, I forget which engineering college. They have developed a program so that they take rural students, mostly a CSD, who uh, at the, after the 10th standard, then for two years, they have to prepare for engineering program also in between while com completing that course uh, per se. So that it is 60, they are assured after the 12th SCs in the engineering college. So they prepare for two years in various engineering disciplines as well in a brief way. So they get that kind of, a, so six years after 10th in the school, you join that and finally you come out successful in the BTEC program. So this is a very interesting experiment. We also thought of uh, duplicating in Kerala. We are giving uh, a representation and talking to the minister and others concerned about this possibility and uh, even a crust school. And we thought that, you know, this, you know there is a whole uh, discussions in the encyclopedia of education where uh, these communities are called at-risk communities, or at-risk students. They are always likely to fail at any moment. But it should be some way we have to make them back and make them su succeed in whatever academic programs they go through. So this is the kind of a situation which we have to realize the gravity of it. And uh, I believe that the planning board of the government of Kerala, we have talked to some of them. They are also uh, agreeable to these kinds of suggestions and we are planning some of these things. And I believe that uh, it is relevant. I thought of talking about it because it is relevant to all of us who are concerned with them. And, and as Ambedkar said, you know, the only through education, only when a sizable number of Dalits and Adivasis reach positions of power, then only you get that kind of respect. This is what Dr. Ambedkar said. This is what Narendra Jadav said. And I think that is something which we have to you give them the best education in the schools, as you rightly said. Now, in the government schools, you know, there is a very recent study on uh, Dalit students in Trivandaburam city itself, the capital, state capital, where the Dalit uh, students who are uh, in the seventh standard can, can't do multiplication or subtraction and speak uh, uh, correct, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, correct words in English or <laughs> even in Malayalam. So this is the situation which, uh, uh, you know, in many schools uh, in Kerala. The only difference is that in the government schools, there are Dalit teachers to some extent. This is a help. 10% of the teachers in the government schools are from Dalit or Adivasi background, while in the uh, the other set of uh, uh, schools which are aided by the government, these are privately run, they don't appoint any Dalit uh, teacher in the schools there or in the colleges. So that is the kind of uh, scenario which you find in Kerala, even though we have been a very uh, progressive uh, kind of society. So nobody cared about these things, you know, they thought that automatically the list will go up, but that didn't happen. Okay, well, thank you very much for the